Hello guys. So this is Green Animate. Uh, we are having the session from now on on Facebook instead on uh, Instagram. So today our guest is uh, Shiva. He is a naturalist and uh, he is 23 years old and uh, he grew up in the Western Ghats in uh, uh, in the Karnataka region. He have also grew, grew uh, he grew uh, in some other parts in coastal Karnataka, and currently he is running a sustainable trekking company. The name of the company is Mount Kinetics. He also started the company when he was at the age of 20, and he introduced thousands of students to wilderness. Now, as a person who loves nature, I can understand that growing up in the Western Ghats can be an amazing experience. Uh, we would all learn about how uh, he got interested into the ideas of sustainability and whether uh, his environment and the beauty of the Western Ghats had something to do with it. So uh, give me a moment uh, while I go ahead and add our guest uh, to the session. Just a moment, please. Okay, so I'm adding, I'm adding uh, Shiv to the session. Sorry for the wait, guys. Uh, we are just trying to get connected over whatever connectivity that we have. Hello, Shiv. How are you? One second, dude. I, I can't hear anything. Mm -hmm. There's some... <laughs> Hello. Hello, Shiv. Hear me. One second. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Sure thing. Yeah. Can, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hello. Hello. Yeah, 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 man, I can do. I don't think my earphones are working, but oh, I, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I, do, I don't uh, use Facebook anymore, so I don't know how it works these days. So it's, it's like <laughs> kind of bumpy. I hope it was not uh, too much of an inconvenience. Uh, no, no, it's, uh, it's not. It's like getting back there all over again so it's like a <laughs> nostalgia <laughs> yeah actually even uh, we were uh, having the sessions all this time on instagram uh, but we mm. decided to have it on facebook because uh, we seem to have more traction over here so just the timing okay. didn't uh, seem to be any more order or uh, you know uh, <laughs> you know what are, what are chances on the same time we decided uh, you know so anyway uh, Thank you so much for uh, agreeing to uh, be a part uh, of the session and taking out the time for this. 
Uh, I know that you are a busy person, uh, you know, having a, your own uh, trekking company. But before we get to all that part, uh, you are a naturalist and you grew up in the Western Ghats, uh, the greenest yeah. parts of the country, uh, yeah. presumably. Like, you know, uh, there isn't any other place which rivals uh, the greenery of the Western Ghats, in my opinion, at least. So yeah. uh, what has been your experience growing up as a child, uh, you know, of, of the greenery, of the wilderness, uh, you know, something that you might want to talk about? Oh, yeah. So uh, I think my first experience as a child was like, you know, just my backyard was like full of forests and, you know, woods. So first thing I remember was like not being allowed to go there. So when I was like four or five, so my grandparents, when my grandparents used to be around, so they used to never let me go to the forest because I'm a, I'm a small kid. So mm -hmm. they wouldn't let me go. And uh, eventually when I grew up, like when I was like seven, eight, then I started going there in the backyard. And then there was like frogs. So the f first memories are like the colorful frogs. So if you have seen a Malabar gliding frog, it's like very colorful. Right? So if you see that, it's like, it's very pretty, like to just to look at. Yeah, so yeah. I used to collect them, you know, I used to pet them and stuff. So, but you know, not like a very mature way to do it. But then, uh, right now, when I think of it, like that's when I actually started getting into nature. So, I was not a, I was not a kid like who used to go out and play cricket and stuff. So I, I was this kid who used to go to the small streams and collect the tadpoles because I didn't know if they were tadpoles or like they were fish fries. So <laughs> I used to think they are like <laughs> the fish, you know, uh, fish fries and I used to get them home and eventually I could just see them metamorphosize and, you know, you see frogs, like, you know, they're like tiny yeah, yeah. legs coming out and, you know, frog, yeah, yeah. Uh, tails disappear and stuff. So, uh, and then we used to have a lot of uh, Indian gods come to our backyard. So even that was like a very... Uh, pleasant. It's, it was not pleasant scene because like, you know, my grandfather was a farmer, so he was, he was not a big fan of it. But then deep down there's like some part of con conservation because they wouldn't kill or hurt the animal. They would just want them to be away from their property. So yeah, th those are like my first memories. So I mean, uh, it's, it's, I think I'm 23 now, so I have seen the guards deplete, but then yeah, uh, I I think I've seen some green parts of Western Guards while while they were still there. I mean, uh, still like you know, you used to play with frogs and you collect tadpoles. Uh, you know, how many kids nowadays would get to uh, say that? You know, it's 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 something that is actually degrading so fast that children and the, nowadays. Uh, the Malabar frogs actually are uh, now endangered, right? Uh, I think it is in the endangered list. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, you can. I can hear you very faintly now. Now, now, is it better? Yeah. Now it's better. Now it's better. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I, I mean, I still live in the guard, so we can't really expect good network here. So <laughs> I'm inside my house, but it's not like the great network. So yeah. Yeah, you, you, you were telling about, you know, uh, kids these days don't get to experience yeah, these yeah. kind of things. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, I mean, uh, when I, my, when my brother grew up, there used to be like a stream right behind my house, like five feet from my house and there used to be a stream and now it's disappeared because the source itself has disappeared. So, and uh, you know what happens when the source of, because it's a biome, right? So, because they're all dependent on, on that particular so so now there are no frogs or fishes or the birds that feed uh, feed on them or like any other sort of reptiles that feed on the frogs so it's reduced drastically but it's not like it's not there but it's it's there but yeah so i have seen them go down in numbers good huh? like you have, you have seen first hand experience first time that there has been a lot of decline in the uh, wild animals and species uh, in and around you yeah, absolutely. There's like, you know, when I first started birding, uh, 
back, back when I was like 16, I, you know, I started getting interested in birding. So I, I, I could just go outside my house and I could just take a you know paper and just write down at least like 30, 40 different species. And now it's come down to like 15 to 16 at a time. So even that is like a, I mean, if you witness yourself, like, you know, whatever is happening around, it's pr pretty clear that it's, it's going down. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Now coming to the part of uh, your business, uh, this sustainable trekking company uh, called yeah. Mount Kinetics. Now, first of all, why sustainable trekking? See, uh, I I think when I was like twenty, I started. I st I didn't have this whole idea of like this sustainable trekking or like we just wanted to be out there, like in the wilderness, and we wanted to take our friends there. So the one thing about uh, Western Ghats is there are certain places in Western Ghats which is also reachable through jeep road, and also you can trek that place. So what happens when a lot of people go there is. You know, people get a lot of trash, and as as soon as it gets like more trouble, people get a lot more trash. So because you know they can carry their booze, they can carry cigarettes, that this everything they want. And one thing they forget to do is like take it back because you have fun, do that, do this. But at at the end of the day, what you don't realize is that you are just leave, because there are no options there. All you could do is like burn it there or like bring it down. So it's again like just transferring the sin that you have done like so it's if it's it's either there in the mountains or it's there in the plains it's there somewhere right so it's not like gone forever so it's there in the system so what we did was like you know uh, my friend uh, clinton so clinton and i started uh, phone kinetics so we decided like you know people want to get into wilderness anyway right why not do it in a sustainable fashion so we thought we pitched the, so every time when we take a batch on a trek in the beginning, we were not like very strict about, you know, this whole plastic, no plastic things and stuff. But then eventually we re realized that almost everybody is willing to do that. Like if you just communicate them, communicate with them right in the right way, I think people usually get it, especially teenagers or like people in their 20s, 30s, they usually get what we are trying to say. So they'll be fine with whatever alternative we are willing to provide. So they were fine with it. So, and one more thing about uh, sustainable trekking, it's not only about the environmental factor, but it's also about the uh, sustainability of the local economy. So what one thing we focus on our treks or like almost all, every trek that we take is that we make sure that we have food at a local house or like a local place, like a, anywhere they are providing food. And uh, we make sure that we take a local guide even if it's like absolutely unnecessary because sometimes what happens is like they imagine like if you come around to Western Ghats, like somewhere in this place of part of Western Ghats, if you can actually explore this place yourself, but then if I am there, I have seen it firsthand, right? So I've seen it. I know the story because the place has told me the story and we have shared a bond. So we have a connection there. So, and when I communicate to the people who are there, so it's more of a, intimate connection than even an expert naturalist explaining it to other people. So what we do is like, we make sure that we take a local guide. So uh, even that's like, uh, I mean, we pay, we, we pay them good money. So, so whatever the reasonable amount we have fixed all of that. And uh, we make sure that we stay in the locals place and, you know, main uh, it's actually connected the whole plastic and local economy. They are like, they go hand in hand because uh, the the more you encourage local economy, the less plastic you produce. Because you know, instead of chips, you can go for chips which are already you know which they can make pakoras or something like that. So it it becomes a healthier a healthier uh, alternative and also like a, a less environment and environmentally less impactful alternative. True, true, true. I, I completely agree because, uh, you know, uh, if a little more development is done, but but that has to be a little, uh, I think, directed towards certain aspects because, you know, when there are a lot of tourists or you see a lot of development in terms of, like, you know, uh, creating malls or, you know, entry of roads into places, uh, those environmental regions have actually degraded. 
uh, because there will be unregulated amount of traffic coming up uh, or uh, unregulated number of people leaving their wastes behind. Uh, all these factors have actually destroyed a lot of ecosystem uh, all across India. Uh, but yes, that is true. I completely agree with you that uh, you know that sustenance, that understanding towards sustenance has to be there. Uh, at the same time, economy, local economy has to be supported because uh, only when the local people are engaged in the process of saving the environment, that is when uh, it would work because that is where the problem is the worst. Uh, what has been your experience, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, what has been your worst experience, rather, tell me about that, uh, in terms of uh, the degradation that you have seen uh, in the wilderness? So I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you a personal favorite of mine. It's it's a favorite when it comes to adventure, but it's not like a favorite because it's destroying uh, what is it, our environment. So uh, so I, I used to be, uh, so I had a friend of mine who was a foreign exchange student and we used to go for, uh, so she had a project about lending and loading water bodies in Western Ghats. So we used to go to different places in the Ghats. So one time what we did was there, you might be very familiar with this uh, project called as Edin Ahole project. So which became like a big issue. Uh, it's, uh, so what happens is there's a river called as uh, Netravati and uh, mm -hmm. Netravati starts from, uh, uh, where is it? It's, 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 it starts from uh, this place called as Gundia. So somewhere around Gundia. So uh, what happens is the water, which is actually directed to the Arabian Sea. So, and they are planning to divert the sea, uh, the water, the river water into bank, you know, it takes the route to Bangalore. So first, first things like uh, back in college, I was not like very familiar with this whole thing, like how big was the project and what's the impact. So when we went there, like we, we were not allowed to go there. So we trespassed uh, saying we are going to a church and all that. And then uh, what happened later was that once we reached the place, then it was not the construction site. It was only the place where the, the, the canals were deployed. Okay. So these concrete canals, which are like, I can say they are around like two, uh, 12 feet in diameter, each canal, they're like 12 feet in diameter. So you can wow. imagine how huge is 12 feet. It's like as big as my room. So it's only when we breeze there, we realize, and there are, and, and it goes around 300 kilometers in the guts. So you dig the guts for 300 kilometers and you put the pipe and you try to put water back to the places which are, see, uh, for, for drinking purpose, it's okay. Like it's still reasonable, right? Humanity over yeah. everything that this, we can still give it to that. But then yeah. what happens there is totally different. The river is not actually flowing in a full fledged form right now so it, it's like it's dripping right now so when we went to the place you know that uh what is it the neighbors like the local local people about the same and uh we asked them about like you know aren't you guys opposing and stuff so some one guy just it, it was like very emotional at that moment he said like if you guys don't do anything about it i'm gonna kill myself right here okay so it was like it was that bad because farmers are you know they are helpless because it's all a political game that was happening there. People, I mean, they wanted a vote bank from the whole, you know, the populated area, which is Bangalore. So uh, it was pretty bad. I mean, we tried to do our best. So we tried to publish the article that we were writing. We tried to do the water analysis because a calf which was born in that area died because the water content, because you start, uh, what is it, like exploding all these rocks, right, in the, because... Western Ghats is like filled with like different terrains. So different terrains, you know, gives rise to mi different minerals. So as long as they're inside a rock, it's fine. But once they're released, they're like absolutely bad. So, uh, and there are certain, so domesticated animals, they had like direct impact on them. But then uh, they finally finished the project, but then there was like the water is still not going there because there's no water at all. So the water still flows here and most of the Mangalorean population doesn't understand the impact of it. Maybe someday they will, but that will be like too late. And, and, yeah. you know, they always keep saying that there's like, we can desalinate the salt water that this, but then, you know, when you, if you are used to fresh water, I don't think you'll get like, you'll be fine with desalinated water because there's like so much more than just ourselves. Right. 
so yeah that thing but yeah I, i mean every time i look back into it and it's it, it's terrible yeah so that's that's the story i mean uh, even if you know uh, there are these projects that they say that uh, you know they are transplanting the e- ecosystem the transpl- uh, the transporting the trees from one place to the other uh, by, by once, because they have to clean up the land uh, to have a project like that right like and for have excavations and all so hundreds or if not thousands of trees have to be removed now how far do you think i mean do you think these are very practical projects where you know do you, do you actually uproot the trees and then plant them somewhere else and you expect those trees to be growing just fine once you plant them like that uh see i'll tell you this is a, it's it's a, it's a blunder obviously it's a blunder because like people think it's going to work uh see uh we see a connection that's on the top right you see a branch you see a trunk and all that so fine you see fruits and leaves everything but then what actually happens there is like a deep connection it's a network of mycorrhiza so mycorrhiza is a group of uh, fungi that grows right so it's, it's a group of f- fungi is called as my- mycorrhiza and it's a network over there and it's all connected so and fungi is are the main reasons why the soils are still fertile and they are the only means through which the trees communicate and if you think that you can take one tree uproot a tree and plant it somewhere and you think it's going to be happy I, i i don't know man i don't i don't think i support that because see again it's like it's fragmentation of ecosystem right so if you fragment ecosystem and you you know place it in different different places do you think they'll attract the same amount of biodiversity as they did before i don't think so it's so it's yeah so it's 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 a it's a very lame thing that they have huh it's not something that you can dismantle somewhere and then mantle somewhere else it's not a machine yeah, yeah it's, it sounds like they're doing lego trees or something yeah. <laughs> that's not how that goes yeah. i mean i actually thank you for uh, bringing up the topic of mycorrhiza over here uh, because you know yeah. that is something that has been so much undervalued uh, in my opinion uh, and it has such it has shown such amazing potential uh with even the the basic of studies that shows how they the plants communicate share nutrients share information you know and then you know there is a this actually a communication have to happening between the trees uh it's just amazing it's just mind blowing to a different level uh yeah. just shows sure. that how beautiful our uh, biodiversity is and again like you know, what we are doing by uh, you know degrading the soil and then you know cutting through the soil because these this networks are getting uh, disrupted and yep. uh, yeah we are we are basically killing the trees even without chopping them off sometimes exactly exactly so uh, have you heard this interesting uh, study so i don't know if it's like a part, it, it is a part of this mycorrhiza yeah. topic so i i'm i'm not really sure with the names uh, i think the university of uh, kyoto did a study on uh, on uh, you know in order to uh, speed uh, fasten the i think underground su- subway system of uh, tokyo yes yes so yes what yes, they yes, did yes, is yes, like they place like yeah so they yes, place yes, on uh, nutrients it was, uh, it was it was i think some fungus uh, uh, it was it was some fungus that they use uh, that actually creates connection and so they exactly, placed yeah. uh, food in a strategic yeah. positions where the st- uh, stations would be and then let the fungus create a map of the best routes between those uh, points and optimal routes in terms of distance and energy and energy, uh, yeah. yeah yeah i remember that uh, it, it's a, it, that was an amazing uh, story actually yes 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 and uh, yeah yeah so yeah so that's i i studied microbiology so i am like pretty much into all of these <laughs> and and the best i think the oh, best part is that you know when when you actually in the in the beginning you'll be all like you know every naturalist is like you know you are either frogs or you are either into birds or like big cats big cats is a big craze now so but oh, then that is like it has to be one of the big cats always yeah so but like deep down like when you when you actually like you know start looking things around you there are 
so i am a big spider buff myself so i did my uh, dissertation on spiders of this particular you know western ghats a small area of western ghats but then uh, yeah with that you come across like so many different animals so many different you know insects and invertebrates so many of them so that's the that's the best part of it because we are only trying to protect like the bigger ones like the things that we are trying to we have tiger project tiger we have project elephant we don't have project butterflies or we don't have project spiders but still there are project butterflies there are the stone oh, there are project, there are project butterflies have, yeah yeah because the special yeah, yeah, interest yeah, yeah, was yeah. butterflies specifically but butterflies. Uh, there won't be any uh, like you know uh, uh, project ground rats you know uh, huh just a general species uh, like you know, you'd, you'd see it only for endangered animals or big animals or majestic ones insects centipedes project centipede like you know let's let's hear for a project centipede or uh, you know or uh, an earthworm you know these are important species and yes i mean uh, vertebrates that's different thing but when you talk about invertebrates that's a whole different uh, arrangement yeah. and array of species especially and then when you go to insects or uh, or arthropods i mean you have a different thing altogether like you know beetles exactly. so many thousand stuff species of beetles right beetles, so yeah. i think and arthropods again, are the so, biggest diversity yeah the most diverse yeah. of uh, all yeah in invertebrates and also one more thing about uh, to add to uh, i mean in order to add something so it, it's like this so the these uh, what do you say invertebrates right so they are the bio indicators themselves so yeah. if you find the presence of these particular because they could be like the most let's say the most common example earthworm so you can okay. decide if rest for you know soil is rich and you know full of humus if there are earthworms right same with the lichen same with a lot of things but yeah so and even even the policy making that like you know more focused towards uh bigger animals and conservation of that so we have we are so happy that we have increased the number of tigers by this 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 we have doubled the tigers i mean tigers are important we're not saying they're not but there are there are other animals that deserve some attention too so yeah i mean uh, i guess uh, the the uh, the term is what keystone species or umbrella species or something like that uh, that's the term mm-hmm. that is used right Yeah. So yes, I mean conserving them is important. Yes, of course. Uh, but at the same time, it's also important to focus on the smaller species, who are indicators, as you said, uh, indicators of the health of the ecosystem. Uh, earthworms uh, being uh, one such, bees probably. Uh, so you know these animals are only seen when the ecology is in proper balance and then all the essential uh, systems and subsystems are there uh, circulating to have uh, a dynamic ecosystem. so yes it is not as easy as it seems it's not just like you know take some uh, water and take an aquarium and you have an aquatic ecosystem like you know no that does not happen right that <laughs> there it is way more complicated uh, otherwise uh, the ecosystem uh, degrading would not have been a concern uh, m- mostly for us for him exactly. but it is uh, it is de- degrading uh, now even in studies that has shown that you know the extinction rate uh, has actually gone up uh, you know there's like uh, some studies say like uh, as per Spitz, uh, smithsonian it says like one species every 1 million uh, is huh. dying every year uh, some says it is accelerating at uh, you know it's the worst affected are amphibians among all the other uh, species or all the other uh, categories of animals or plants uh amphibians are the worst affected uh, among animals i guess um, hmm. and obviously i think amphibians are uh, hardly seen uh, frogs uh, toads mostly no salamanders uh, i don't know like you know any more uh, anyone see salamanders anymore uh, or not uh, i and... have i have seen salamander like twice in my whole wow. life <laughs> so it's, it's, I have seen and it once. And that's from someone who's living in the Western Ghats, where it should have been like that's like a yeah. natural habitat of salamanders. Exactly, exactly. So it should have been here, but it's not here. But I mean, it's you if you go towards Shirsi, Konnavar, and those places, there, there are still there. There are some of them, but it's not as much as you know back in those days. Like you know, my grandfather used to tell me. so my grandfather once told me that he had actually hunted 
I, I'm not supposed to say this because it could be an illegal thing, but I would say it anyway. So I'm kind of like proud of it. So my my not proud of it really, but my grandfather has seen a uh, uh, Malabar spotted civet, which is like, which is as equal to extinct and wild. So Malabar spotted civets are like they are civets, but they have the spots, uh, the Malabar civets with spots. So uh, and he do he. He's not only seen them; he's actually a hunt one of them. So when when there was a survey in nineteen ninety seven or something, there were one ninety three left in wild. And you know, when I think about it, like past three years, when I've been thinking about my grandfather, probably he's one of the reasons why it actually went extinct. Because they But were not aware you know, of what they were doing. Of, just, uh, you know how rare they were or how important they were. That was not there. You know, uh, so. because uh, they did not see in their lifetime the situation to be so bad uh, it was still exactly. there you know it that was the case you know or they've heard like you know those things being abandoned and they were considered as you know treated as common animals like and how you treat anything else so uh, yeah. amphibian going rare in uh, in forests uh, where there is high rainfall is something which is huh. basically uh, which would have been uh, would would have been an unthinkable situation in any other place or exactly. considering the degradation did not happen so so uh, I, i think one of the main reasons uh, amphibians are mostly affected is uh, because amphibians are the only ones in the vertebrate uh, they use they need both water and land and they need water yeah. to complete their sexual reproduction so when somebody is like when you are actual you know playground where you know actually find a mate and you know produce offspring is actually being taken away it I, i think it comes back to the opening point i made that you know the streams are actually drying up that's actually those because if there is no water streams the they might seem like a very narrow stream of water but they give life to like me thousands probably millions of uh, animals in a, in a particular year in so the, yeah the, that's and also like you know how you mentioned you know one uh, species per year uh, for, for uh, millennia per year did you say year or what is uh, it i think it is uh, per year but i'm not sure but uh, that was the data from uh, smithsonian uh, it is per year i guess oh. i think it uh, okay. it's it's too yeah. like um, so so recently i was watching attenborough's uh, you know witness statement they made a new uh, uh-huh. documentary right so Yeah, yeah, yeah we have had uh, five massive uh, extinctions okay so on planet earth so 4 yeah. million 4 billion years and we have had five mass extinctions w- one thing that we know in common w- everything that has in common is that you know the earth actually started heating and uh, yeah. the temperatures went like up and down and you know they went abnormally crazy so and they happen in a span of like million years so they don't happen in a course of a year two or three no they happen like 10 million years so in two you know yeah. uh, i think 250 million years ago so there's like the, i think the third uh, mass extinction and uh, it wiped out 97% of all life on planet and it took around 10 million years to get back life so for it to be normal and stuff but then what happened in last 200 years is worse than all of this so we have yeah. accelerated the process to such an extent it's like they put all the boosters to you know let's kill let's finish it we're like trying to finish this planet and uh, most of the million, you know uh, millionaires and billionaires let's not say most of them there are few of them who are planning to flee the planet right so they were like yeah let's go to mars let's go to find home somewhere else i'm not saying i'm against those but i don't think it's gonna because we are a species and this is a planet and it is a it, it we are a part of it so it, it's almost impossible for us to leave and you know find something elsewhere well Or right now that option seems very unfeasible like you know because of all the studies uh, i don't think anything that is positive coming up in that part at least uh, going to another planet it like exactly. it would take at least thousands of other years uh, more years to prepare a planet like mars probably uh, or to become something like earth to uh, like earth to have a habitable planet so this is the best thing that we have uh, this planet is the best solution yeah. that we have and uh, you know yeah. we need to work towards it towards protecting it and 
Yeah, you said that, you know, uh, it is important because, uh, you know, uh, but, uh, there are people who might be thinking that, you know, uh, we can have another way if even if we, can we act uh, later on, all, uh, you know, but people don't understand that we have lost that time. We have lost the time to act. And if we don't do something now, things are going to be so bad uh, and whatever that, that is there, that is left, might still be lost. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, and one thing we need to remember uh, with all that is that we are doing it for ourselves. We are not doing it for other animals. We are not doing it for Earth. We are doing it for ourselves. We are trying to see, uh, you know, each species has this thing. You try to save yourself as a species. And the only way humans can survive this is as a huge unit together. And I think like everybody has to step, you know, st step up with us and, you know, they have to uh, actually start doing something about it because it's it's just going to be for us. It, it's not for the nature. It's not for the giraffe that you saw on a safari. It's, it's going to be for yourself. If you want to be here, if you want to see your species to thrive in the future, you'll definitely have to do something about it. So, because if we, if we, if it's not us, like nature can relapse, like no, ma no matter how many exactly. times we fuck it up. Exactly, so exactly. it's Maybe not going to be big deal for it at all. You know, uh, a lot of people say save the planet. I, I completely disagree with that idea because uh, the planet, we cannot destroy the planet. The planet has gone exactly. through way worse things than human species. Uh, you exactly. know, a lot of extinction play phases, lavas, volcanoes, a lot of bad things. You know, uh, the only thing that would happen is all the life might be gone. We would be gone for certain and we would take a lot of life along with us. A lot of species will be gone along with us. Exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> you know, there, there, there will be still one bacteria or two bacteria that's remaining. Maybe an extremophile which was preparing itself for yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. And that will come back, yeah. right? But they will come. we won't be there. Nature will different. spring back again from them. Like, you know, you would see uh, another, another, another nature, but there won't be any blue whales anymore, probably. There won't be elephants. Exactly. There won't be tigers. There won't be those majestic animals that a lot of people uh, say that they love. Uh, they won't hmm. be there anymore. Uh, they will be different species probably. Uh, another, but it would be like uh, creating a bottleneck on the natural process. We are just creating uh, a bottleneck and we are choking out the life out of a lot of other species that uh, deserve to be uh, here on the planet. Uh, a lot of species we have already lost. Uh, you know, many, many species that we have lost. And uh, it's just it's a count that is just going up and up and up. And uh, exactly, do you think exactly. like you know this thing will go on? Like you know we will keep on losing species. Do you think that that, uh, that is something which seems like a practical future? Uh, see, uh, I I I think uh, from what I believe, uh, we won't lose a lot of species in the future because I'll tell you one thing: we have been polluting, we have been doing a lot of shit for like last two hundred years. But this is the only generation which is actually aware of these things. So 1980s, 1990s, that was the time when actually people started realizing that, oh, shit, it's going bad, right? So now people have actually started realizing things. Governments have actually, not just the Indian government, I'm speaking like a global scale. People are actually realizing it all over the world. So it's almost like impossible. It's, it's, we cannot afford to lose one more species. So we might have lost, uh, uh, I don't know, in, in, in past couple of years, we have lost a lot of species. Let's say probably four to five extinctions in last uh, couple of, probably last two decades. Uh, but then uh, in the future, I think we'll find better ways for, uh, see, there is like in vitro and uh, in situ and ex situ conservation. So if something doesn't work out, we can always go for the other one. Because if it's the last option that we have, if it's, you know, do, uh, what is it? Uh, if it's going to die there or like I could actually get it and, you know, start doing something about it, you know, probably grow it in the lab and stuff like that, eventually releasing it to the wild wilderness. So it's not going to be the same thing, but we'll still have some of those. I mean, I'm not saying it's a very ethical practice to do, but it's still a form of conservation, but it's, it's not yeah. going to be like a zoo or something. Because you actually take the animals and you, you know, uh, put them back. Because 
i think pandas pandas are one of the biggest examples because exactly. pandas were like an endangered species for like really long time and yeah, uh, yeah. the wwf even made it the logo of uh, their organization because it's like yeah. an extinct you know it's endangered so species Yes, yes. And uh, I was actually about to say uh, another species. Uh, I think uh, vultures. Uh, vultures had been uh, reared like th- uh, like that right now in some parts in India, Pinjore, and I think uh, somewhere in Boxa uh, and, and somewhere mm-hmm. else. Two, three or four places where uh, you know uh, the vulture conservation project is going on. So when I was like you know uh, learning about them, I then started to understand uh, what was the state, current state of vulture population, and I was like shocked to know that they were at the brink of extinction. and you know that was just because of uh, this nsa nsa that was given to the cows and that was staying inside yeah. the body and you know when vulture would eat their corpses they would not digest it and it would fail the kidneys and they will die slowly and painfully yeah. and until like yeah. more than 90% of the vulture species was like wiped out from plan of of of, of india at least you know they were all gone uh, it was like such a uh, bad state and uh, and i i remember you know there's something that i could correlate because when i was young uh, probably uh, 20 years uh, more than 20 years ago i could remember uh, the sides of the road sometimes you would see one or two vultures they were not a something of an uncommon sight but then i don't see vultures anymore you know there are no well, vultures like you know last time i saw a vulture was probably somewhere in himalayas uh, you know because there was a, a corpse of a cow on the street and then the vulture was happily eating that <laughs> so that was the last time i saw it uh, and uh, nowhere uh, in the uh, thing only probably in the pinjo national forest and uh, mm-hmm. you know then there was a study that showed that you know along with the declining vulture population there was an increased incidence of rabies because the dogs started taking up their ecological position and you know they would be, uh, be yeah, in the in the dump yards and those places more and they would carry the diseases more so other diseases uh, which like you know would the the uh, you know which the vultures would not be able to spread the dogs would then spread and then the uh, incidence of the diseases went up so how things are related it actually the reason i went through the story was to just uh, focus on the same fact you know how loss of one species can impact everything else and something some uh, completely we might feel unrelated uh, thing a phenomena might, can take place because of this you know vulture yeah. species going off and then dogs biting humans two different things in in our in our heads but apparently not so yeah co co extinction uh, yeah now uh, taking your yeah. species uh, and uh, as a naturalist uh, i must ask you this uh, what is your favorite species or class of species rather i i am always going to go uh, my favorite uh, genus let's say uh, minus Ar- arachnida so i'm a, i'm okay. a big time fan of spiders and uh, i can go okay. deep down uh, uh, salticidae to be very precise jumping spiders jumpers so they are and like very fascinating because because of their spiders. symmetry I mean, so they are like uh, they, they they catch their prey or by jumping on them uh, something like that uh, exactly exactly so they don't build a nest or something so they can jump like 40 times the size and they they catch this prey and more than that more than their behavior they have a very uh, they have a very symmetrical body so if you look at it yeah. uh, under a periscope or some, not a periscope what is what is called it it's a, a mic uh, not a microscope stereoscope stereoscope oh stereoscope stereoscope okay, okay yeah so what you see is like if you keep turning it it's it's like you're actually looking inside a kaleidoscope because they are so pretty they are so pretty so yeah and they keep jumping around and uh, yeah they kind of fun so and they are very nice to observe because like they they are there everywhere like, probably like right now in my room there are like three four and they they keep eating all the mosquitoes so they do a lot of good things yeah basically they do a good job then yeah they they are like the tenants who pay my rent <laughs> Yeah, exactly. They they uh, they they pay the rent by uh, keeping their roof insect free. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so it's it's sad how uh, you know there is a, a thing of fear uh, that goes around spiders. I mean, I spiders. as as child, even I had a lot of arachnophobia. You know, uh, you know, big spiders they scared the like hell out of me. Uh, still does to some extent, but I I try to like you know get over my fear and try to. Uh, it's just that that that. that 
but the, the, that eight legged thing and all. And I can understand, I can relate to that. At the same time, you know, just the species that gets a bad reputation, you know, uh, and I think these are the gentlest of creatures sometimes. Uh, even snakes, you know, uh, snakes. such majestic uh, species. Uh, um, I think arachnids, they are, they, they show an apex towards evolution for insects uh, in terms of their advancements and, you know, uh, whatever they have evolved to, the mechanisms that evolved to, to, uh, to become, you know, th that, that good predators. Uh, yes. It shows something, it shows the experience that the species have and the importance of the species on our planet. Exactly. Exactly. Oh. And uh, yeah, uh, I think like you know when you mentioned about uh, snakes and uh, animals, so why so nobody no nobody in my friend circle really likes spiders. But like when I show them pictures that I have clicked, they're like, oh wow. And then I show them a picture that I have clicked and where it looks actually very gruesome. They don't like it. So it's actually just the if it's pretty, they like it. If if it's not, it's but yeah, they don't I think actually the understand the eight eyes and uh, you know uh, eight eyes and like you know uh, four pairs of uh, legs and poison exactly. fangs and like you know uh, yeah. those things doesn't sound very attractive to a lot of people. attractive yeah uh, and people. see uh, there's like only one like one percent of Indian species of uh, arachnids which are actually venomous to humans which will not but it will like. It could be like some, to some extent, it could be mortal. But uh, rest of them are like absolutely. I think you can actually be around them. They're not going to come over to you and bite you because they'll see you like maybe like much faster than you see them because they have their network yeah. all around, and they have yeah. and they have eight eyes, and and yeah, they're exactly. all like placed in the right way <laughs> so that they can see everything else. If you are entering a room. The spider knows that you are entering the room even before you decide that you are entering the room. So it's, yeah, exactly, it's, it's exactly. that thing, yeah. So And there's a yeah. lot to learn from them, especially the material science of spider and their uh, silk. It's like mind-blowing. Oh, so, yeah. That's that's next, next next thing altogether. Like, and I think uh, still there are studies that are going on to find out like, you know, a same replica of uh, spider web uh, of like you know, yeah. making something a material that is that strong because the best that we have is like you know some form of steel alloy which is not even close to uh, the efficiency and the molecular efficiency of these uh, substances. So I think that's evolution. Like you know, so that's what millions of years of evolution does. Like you know, lot of lots of chances of experimentation. Nat nature took its own sweet time to experiment on different stuff and came up with uh, one of the most brilliant and beautiful uh, answers uh, that nature can provide. And the, the thing is that the show keep, keeps on happening and it will keep on continuing. Like you know, the, there would be next stages of evolution happening probably in some other million years or something like that. Because we won't be around exactly. to see that happen. Yeah, so, we yeah. Won't, let's, let's hope our species at least, let's, let's say at least homo deus or I don't know, homo superior. I don't want to call them homo superior because I don't think we'll get superior because they're like, we'll still be the same homo sapiens still hanging around, maybe one or two of them. But we'll, I, I have, a, I have, I really hope and I believe that, you know, we make it through for at least like a million years and, you know, we'll see what's there, like everybody gets to know what's actually happening and, you know, they enjoy and uh, now we have, start, we have started keeping records which are not just fossil records. So, so for I think for uh, uh, till we started uh, painting probably which is around 40 40 thousand years ago before that we don't have any records of anything right but now we have all data so yeah I think yeah. the smarter we get there are like better chances of us handling and tackling this whole problem so yeah so let's 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 hope that you know people actually make it through because yeah, we, we are the only hope we got. We can't rely on planet anymore. Yeah, yeah. we are the ones who uh, got us this far and like we are the ones who who can do something about it. I mean, uh, exactly. I was just about to uh, say about this thing, like you know, I uh, learned about this term called Anthropocene, uh, which basically uh, like an indicator of the human impact on the planet. And like, you know, that, that was the impact, like, you know, that was 
so huge the impact was of humans on the planet was that they had you know the scientists had to come up with a name a geological name like it's something that yeah. lasts for millions of years and we in our like you know fractions of an experience of, of of our existence of that millions of years we actually impacted that entire era of uh, of ge- geology and that if we consider if we really think about it uh, we actually try to appreciate uh, the exact nature of uh, impact that we had on the planet it has been that tectonic uh, it has literally shook the planet uh, we think that it, it like the, the planet itself is very resilient but we have le- left our marks in places you know which cannot be even imagined right exactly exactly when we, when we when we think about it like how how can we make it worse how we have done a lot of good things but how can we make it bad we have done almost everything that we can do <laughs> so there's like nothing worse that can happen we're already doing it all we could do is like you know cut down a little you know like you no know, hold our guts and like you know stop doing what you're doing but uh, yeah like i mean thinking about it like we have also reached moon we have reached past uh, what is it neptune we have sent stuff so we we are smart we are like the smartest people i mean the smartest of all species i could say that because we have tech, technologically smart i could say but i mean there are i mean we can you can give me an example like beavers make dam and spiders make you know web and stuff but then we have reached somewhere and i think we have to reach that singularity stage where we decide to use our knowledge for good so if we put yeah. all see i think like you know when all the countries decide to come together like let's fucking save the planet let's not fight anymore about anything let's do something about the planet let's use the resources to do it why not imagine like the amount of money that's being put on the rv and stuff with that so if we can actually use it to do something more productive like you know probably replantation or like you know there are so many things rewilding of a particular terrain then we can actually go get i mean there are some countries which are actually doing that for example tasmania tasmania is like one of the most it has a green government so it's an environmental party so yeah. all they do is like all their uh, what is it so all the things that they promise before an election is about the environment so and they almost deliver it all the time because they had seen the uh, death of uh, extinction of tasmanian devil the tasmanian tiger not the tasmanian devil the tasmanian tiger so after that they actually became very precarious and they started replanting their whole country so much that they have i think almost 56 57% of their country is forest now so wow, wow. Yeah. yeah yeah i remember uh, some some rare footage of that marsupial uh, tasmanian tiger uh, you know some inside some cage and probably that was the last known ever uh, known footage of that thing uh, it is we traded and they were like killed mercilessly like there was the entire population of mar- and probably that's only marsupial which was like that uh, which looked like uh, a mammal uh, and yeah which looked know, like a dog it's it looks like, like a dog exactly so a marsupial yeah. that, so that shows the the beauty of if, if evolution like two different type of species evolving into almost two very similar forms uh, i think convergent yeah. evolution right hmm exactly exactly and that so, uh, yeah so i mean uh, also one more thing to add like before uh, i forget it like so w- one of the main reasons this whole thing has been happening is also because imperialism was like one of the main reasons because like in india especially so they hunt down most of the cheetahs we had in our subcontinent yeah. so we had cheetahs here Big and we had a lot people. of lots and lots of elephants lots and lot of tigers leopard leopard number increased because there were other predators like which is cheetah so uh, and tiger and uh, even lion so so much of lion everything but uh, almost everything is like now just like in the pictures and stuff like that and even the size like you know when we were in darjeeling when we visited the national history museum so even that is like you can see huge what is it the the foot and the tusk and all that they're like huge but you i don't think you find such huge elephants anymore here because even they have reduced so most of them have been gone for that so yeah so 
and now they have realized that they are apologizing and stuff but yeah it and we ca- we cannot really blame third world country so what's happening there it's also like a, a thing the first world countries are putting all the blames on china india because we are like population that is but they took their sweet time to grow and become a developed country but when we are in the process i mean there are certain things we don't have a carbon footprint assessment yet right but uh, it's it's a compulsion in the first world country but they try to in almost all the documentaries what this is like yeah cows produce the most amount of methane so where where do cows come from india and china so but who eats the most amount of cows so that's also a question so yeah so we we, we have been blamed a lot but we are we are trying to do our best like you know i'm trying to do my best i know a lot of people around who are uh, and especially the small scale vendors and stuff if you just go to them talk to them out like you know not use plastic or sell, sell the products that they can you know prepare there right there they'll be willing to do it so those are like the small i think changes that we can do which can actually be like huge difference in the in the in the grand picture wow wow yeah man like it is a small step that matters this is how we can uh, make the change is to have this uh, small individuals uh, uh, in- individual people uh, business owners small business owners uh, or people with the awareness and the motive to make or uh, do something about the improvement of the nature and the environment uh, once we can come together and uh, you know combine our actions probably we can have a strong influence on uh, the policies and practices even as well as you know having a mar- large scale change uh well shiv uh, thank you so much for uh, giving us time today uh one last question i would like to ask you though is that uh, if we can do something to uh, conserve species or the wilderness uh, what can we do what should be your recommendation i think first thing uh... that we need to do is like be aware of your surrounding go outside at least like once a day take a walk around like if there is a forest or like wherever you are just look at the trees look at every intricate details which are there so once you start seeing them you will start loving them i i i'll tell you this is definitely going to happen even a heartless person will fall in love with those tiny insects or like you know the birds or like the trees whatever are there right so that's going to be a first step so if you reach there to the stage where if you are being affected if a tree is being cut down at a distance then you are there like so you are an aware person you are an emotion you are emotionally attached to it so that's like one of the things you could uh, you should start doing and the next thing is like support local economy support local economy that's like the best thing you could do and uh, the more the more uh, you support these local vendors and uh, you buy things from the smaller ch- not from the chain just from an individual vendor the better it is for everything so the, the bigger the uh, chain the lesser the what is it the more the, the bigger the chain bigger the impact so if you buy it from a direct vendor so it's like a better thing to do and uh, yeah educate yourself about what's happening don't live in denial so that's also one thing so if you think there's like we can witness it like i'm sweating right now even if it's like you know it's pretty cold outside it's but it's it's a time which is actually not so hot but it's hot right now Good. so and uh, even the monsoons have changed so we have to acknowledge it as they are rather than uh, you know trying to say ha ha yeah that will happen yeah but, but we shouldn't live in denial so stop living in denial you know start acknowledging everything that's happening then yeah you you are there and stop stay, say say no to single use plastic and most importantly vote right if you vote right a lot of things can change so the most important decision you need to do is like vote right person who can listen to you even if there's like some sort of change that you have to do if you want to you know improve the lake that's there in your village or something not cut down the tree or like something like that replantation they will help you so yeah so those are my tips 
I should say. Okay. So basically, what you're saying is that we should be uh, aware of our surroundings. We have to be more proactive towards the things that we believe in. Uh, so we have to do those things instead of talking about it. We have to support the local economy because only when that happens, then uh, the engagement of local people towards the nature, uh, towards the national causes, can be uh, supported. Exactly. Awareness is necessary towards uh, what is going on. Yes, that is true. Uh, and single-use plastic, you said, you know, we we should be uh, getting rid, or we should not use single-use plastic. Uh, we should use our voting rights, very important, and planting trees. Yes, absolutely. We need to. If all of us started planting one trees, uh, or if we uh, initiate or planting of trees instead of cutting down, if we can reverse that ratio in some way, uh, then probably uh, there can be a better hope for, you know, the the years ahead. All right, then. Uh, thank you so much, Shiv, uh, for giving us the time. Uh, it was an amazing experience talking to you. I really enjoyed uh, some of the, you know, uh, specific talks that we had about uh, biodiversity, about different species, uh, you know, stuff within biology, because I love that subject as well. I respect that subject a lot. And I respect people who uh, work in this field. Uh, so, you know, my respect goes to you too. Uh, and I hope that you find a lot of uh, success in your work. Uh, and uh, I wish that, uh, you know, through combined effort, we can have a better uh, planet, uh, probably uh, conserve our biodiversity before they are gone. All right, then. Yes, uh, well, uh, you have a good day and bye-bye. Uh, Thank you, man. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. All the best for you, too. <laughs> All right, bye. How do I end? I don't know how to end this. <laughs> okay, you can just uh, leave the session or I can just X you out from here and you will be gone. All right, then I will be taking you out from the session. Bye. All right, guys. So this had been our uh, first Facebook session for uh, Green Animate. Uh, this will go on uh, on the Facebook platform. Uh, only the timing would not be on Friday. This was only probably for this week or only for emergency situations. Uh, expect the sessions to be on Sundays at the same time and we will be always keeping or making updates on when our next session is going to be. So stay tuned until we uh, post our next content and all of you have a good day. Bye-bye.